I was born in 1936, October 1936, in Antwerp, Belgium. Uh, my father came from Lithuania, my mother came from Poland, and uh, my father went to a college called Liège in Belgium, and he uh, studied engineering, a very prestigious college. He met my mother there and married in 1930, I don't remember the exact date now, but I was born in <coughs> 1936. I have two older brothers, uh, one 13 months older than me, and the other one uh, four years older than me. Uh, he's now a psychiatrist, a psychologist in uh, Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, which is n next to Philadelphia. We had a very nice life there. Uh, quiet, My had a lot of family there. My mother's sisters all settled in the area. And life was good, uh, no complaints about that. Then one night, 1940, my parents were out for the evening and <clears throat> I was in my bed and I woke up to terrible noise, terrible noise and I looked out the window and I see fire everywhere and our house was shaking. I got scared stiff, I was just a little boy and I jumped into my oldest brother's bed and he was already awake too. He was also quite scared and he, uh, he was hugging me. I don't know if he was hugging me to comfort me or if he was hugging me because he was as scared as I was. Uh, next thing I know, it's the middle of the night or it was early morning already, I don't remember. My parents rushing into the house and saying, get dressed, get dressed, get dressed. What's going on? The Germans were bombing Belgium where we were they're bombing Antwerp but then they were strafing the houses, setting everything on fire. My mother quickly called her sisters up and we made a caravan of cars to try to escape. We thought we would escape to France. On, on the road, we, I mean, just imagine your home, your, your parents come rushing in, tell you, get dressed, take a, give you a small bag, just a change of clothes, and that's it. All your toys, everything you have, anything that you think is valuable, forget about it. You just run, make a run for it. And that's what we did. We, I think we were a three or four car caravan. Uh, as we got moving, the Germans started strafing the roads and the cars and everything else. Uh, we had to jump out of the car a few times. We were lying in ditches. I remember my father lying on top of my brother and I, and I could, even when I talk about it, I could almost taste the sand in my mouth. Uh, but we got away. All around us, cars were hit, and there was uh, fire. People were killed all over. I mean, it was really death row. We didn't get that far, but far enough to get away from the immediate attacks. We were hiding in barns at night. We were trying to make it to Dunkirk or Lapin and getting a, uh, some kind of transportation to England. We didn't make it that far, but my father, just prior to all this, he had a feeling that war was coming. He was a very smart man, he was, yeah, and he read the papers and listened to the news and everything. And he said, you know, if there's a war, it's going to be very difficult. Money doesn't matter. Nobody wants cash during a war. The only thing that's valuable, diamonds. And he bought quite a bit of diamonds. He was a very comfortable man. He bought quite a bit of diamonds and he hid them all the time. So we managed to get, uh, Dunkirk was impossible. My only one who got through to Dunkirk was my cousin, who at that time was 18 and uh, they wouldn't let him on the, any ship. They told me he should go back into Belgium and join the army, etc. There was thousands of people on the beaches at Dunkirk. I mean, you, there was a movie called Dunkirk. You may or may not have seen it. He saw a Polish unit over there, Polish soldiers who were stationed not far off, and they were doing laundry. So he snuck up behind them and he stole a uniform, put it on, and when they were boarding a ship to go to England, he uh, just casually walked on with them. Uh, as they got close to uh, Dover in England, uh, they got a bit suspicious of him. But before they had a chance to uh, arrest him or do anything, I believe he jumped off ship and he made it into Dover. And that's where he stayed for the rest of the war for about four and a half years. Nobody knew what happened to him till about a year after the war, I think it was when he managed through the Red Cross to contact his parents, uh, my aunt. We made it to Spain, but they wouldn't let my father through. They said my, my mother and, the, and us children could get through, 
but not my uh, father because he was of army age also. My father made it, went all the way around into Morocco and he got hold of his brother who lived in America, had been living in America for quite a while and was a successful man. And through all the diplomatic channels and all, um, my mother gets, gets called into the Spanish embassy and they tell her, you know what, send your husband a telegram saying the children are very ill, come immediately. One telegram, another telegram didn't work. Finally, the third time, they had a desperation telegram, come immediately, the children are very ill, we need you. They let my father through. Of course, some diamonds were in exchange also, but we made it to Spain. From there, we managed to get on a train to Portugal. Portugal was about the last halfway free bastion that people could escape to. It was full of refugees. Uh, you imagine a train station, dark, no electricity, no nothing, but the trains were running. Uh, but they had blackouts, though. They didn't want to be bombed. And all over, you saw Gestapo agents. Uh, it's, that's the secret service of the German army. And they were eyeing us, and they knew they, they were just waiting to get their hands on us. Uh, we're trying to keep away from them. It was a very, very terrible, scary time. We got separated from the rest of the family, my mother, sisters, etc., and all. They eventually, by the way, made it to Cuba. Uh, we made, <coughs> we got a uh, train uh, from Spain to Portugal, and while on the train, which was packed with people, packed with people, there was uh, also a Belgium soldiers there, and there was a Belgium officer standing next to us, and seated was a man middle-aged man, and he just sat there, he didn't say a word. So one of the Belgium officers said to him, Monsieur, Monsieur Casquillier, what's wrong with you? Uh, we know there's a war, but give the lady a seat. Let her sit. She's got three little children. And he just went like this and just sat there. So the officer started getting a little bit angry with him. There were some other soldiers with him and said, again, please give the lady a seat. And he said, no, I'm a sick man, I've got a bad leg. So the officer was really PO'd at this time, and he said to him very plainly, you've got choices in life. He said, you can get up, give the lady the seat so she can sit with her children, or you can sit here and we'll shoot you and throw you off the train, or you can put two of the children on your lap. And by this time, he was burning angry, but he saw he had no choices. So he said, okay, I'll take the children on my lap. So the Belgian officer picks me up, puts me on his lap over here. Then he goes to my brother, picks him up, puts him on his other leg. And with that, my brother, he's a little boy. We were little kids then, maybe five years old, six years old. You know, he, his leg kicked. He kicked a man's leg. He had a transmitter in his pants. He was a German spy and he was trying to get to the uh, German Air Force to bomb the train. He was going to get off the next stop, and then the train would be bombed, and hundreds and hundreds of people were going to be killed. Of course, they shut it off immediately. They took him off the train, and they, they shot him. We make it to Portugal, and uh, again, my uncle, my father's brother, arranged visas for us, temporary visas, to go to America. And it was only a temporary visa, but who cares, you know, when uh, the enemy is right behind you, literally just miles. You'll get away any way you can. We did. We got on the board. It was a very rough trip because there were German submarines all over the place. Plus, the waters were very rough. But we landed in New York. This is uh, 1941 now. And who's waiting for us besides family, State Department, and the FBI? And they stop us. Uh, first, they gave us all an exam to make sure that we were in decent health, which is fine, I can understand that. Then they tell my parents, okay, you can only stay here for a certain amount of time, maybe a few months, and then go back to Belgium voluntarily, or we're going to send you there. And my parents said, how can you send us back to Belgium? Belgium is a conquered country. We're Jewish. They're killing Jews left, right, and center. They're killing Catholics. They're killing everybody that's not a so-called good German uh, friend. They could have cared less. So we were, we were in trouble again, but at least we were in America. My father's brother uh, was a very comfortable man. He had textile mills in China and in the Philippines. The Philippines at that time 
was American protectorate. Because of the Spanish-American War, American troops were stationed there. And uh, in order to get anything done there, you had to go through the American embassies. But because he had a big business going there, we got permission to go to Manila. Manila was called the uh, Pearl of the Orient, a beautiful, pretty beautiful place, but so hot that you can't imagine. I mean, the hottest day here is a cold day over there. Uh, and coming from Belgium, where it's usually cold and fairly damp, to a place like the Philippines was a tremendous climate change. Us being young, we didn't feel it so much. My parents really felt it. But my uncle happened to be at the time uh, in the Philippines also, and he arranged a small apartment for us. And we figured, you know, a few months and we'll be able to get some kind of a visa to either go to America or Canada or something like that. And again, the papers were full of stories about Japan and America, uh, about trade relations and this and that, and the talks weren't going well at all. And my father said to my mother, you know what, I think we'd, we've jumped from the pot to the fire. Things are not looking good here, and we could easily get into a war again. My father, being a rather very, very bright man, went out and he bought canned goods. And he said, look, we didn't, it wasn't that much because we didn't even have that much money left at that time. But he bought a lot of canned goods and he said, we're going to use this just in case of a real emergency that we have no food. Took the canned goods we had in the house and every week for four and a half years, he was turning them over. Because if you turn them over every week or so, uh, they'll stay good, otherwise they blow up and uh, throw, you have to throw them out. All of a sudden, it's December 7th, 1941. You guys know what happened December 7th, 1941? Pearl Harbor, right? The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And I still don't understand how Pearl Harbor uh, was hit like that because the Japanese Navy, uh, they had a few aircraft carriers, battleships, submarines, everything, went from Tokyo now, you've got to really look at a map to see this around the Pacific to Hawaii, how they weren't noticed. How not a single ship, not a single airplane saw it, I don't know. But you know what? I feel the same way about 9-11. When guys come and say they want to learn how to fly, and they said, no, we just want to learn how to take off. We're not worried about landing. And that doesn't get to the FBI or something. Something's wrong somewhere, but that's the way it was. What can you do? It was only a couple of weeks before the Japanese landed into Manila, where we were. Uh, General MacArthur was there, and he declared Manila an open city, which means that the American troops were going to retreat. They weren't going to fight the Japanese, but don't harm the city, the beautiful city of Manila and the people that live there. Now, prior to that, uh, General MacArthur and General Eisenhower were both in the Philippines. General Eisenhower, you may know, became president there in 1950s, uh, and there was a man there named McNutt. Now, the president of the Philippines was a man called, named Manuel Quezon, a very religious Catholic who was a very loved person. And he said to Eisenhower and to MacArthur and McNutt, he said, there's so many rumors and stories flying out about what's going on in Europe with this fellow Hitler. Uh, is it all true? Are they really killing people left, right, and center? Are they sending Jews to gas chambers? Are they killing children and all? And the answer was, yes, it's terrible. So Kazan said, you know what? We have a Jewish community here, and they're very good. Uh, they've done very well. They've helped the country a lot. I like the Jews. They're very good people, and they've done a lot for the country. He said, I'll tell you what. Bring me one million Jews, Catholics, gypsies, whatever you want, but bring me one million. We'll settle them in the Philippines. We have the island of Mindanao, we have Batan, Corregidor, we have Manila. We'll settle them in. McNutt got very excited about this. Uh, Eisenhower and, and MacArthur apparently sent cables to the States, and McNutt was so excited he went to America to try to talk to Roosevelt and uh, some of the uh, State Department people. The answer was no. They said, we don't want to be responsible for a million people. We're, they're all going to become welfare cases, et cetera, et cetera. 
and we, we can't afford to have this happen. McNutt was so upset that he resigned and he went back to Indiana where he was from. Uh, just think about it. One million, how can you say no if someone's trying to save one million people? How can you say no to them? How can this happen? This was the times. It happened. They didn't want any Jews. So we thought maybe we'd get to America now, you know, just prior to Pearl Harbor. Again, the answer said, there's a Jewish quota here. We don't want any more Jews here. And I think it was the same with the gypsies and probably some of the Catholics who, who were also there. All right, comes Pearl Harbor. A couple of weeks later, we hear marching down the street already, Japanese soldiers, full of Japanese soldiers. They rounded us up and they brought us to Santa Tomas, St. Thomas in English, which was a university at that time, a pretty well-respected university. They turned it into a prison camp. We were there for a few weeks. We were just lying. There was hardly any food, hardly anything. We basically had the clothes we were wearing. It was a terrible time. And then one day, there was a, uh, a German, a Japanese officer walking by, and my father heard him say something in English. So he got an idea. He went to him, and he said, Sir, he said, excuse me. He said, you know, we're not at war with uh, Japan. We are Belgium citizens. We're not Americans. You're at war with America now, but you're not at war with Belgium. And you're not allies with Germany in particular. They did become allies after a while, but not at that time. He said, why are you holding us? I've got my wife and children here. So a Japanese officer looked at him, and then he checked, he checked us out, came back a couple of days later, and he says, OK, we'll, we'll do uh, business. We'll do something. He said, OK, I'm going to offer you something. He said, you are now in the bristle business, I understand. By the way, bristles uh, came about, uh, that's the uh, screen doing that. Uh, I, nothing much. I, the the uh, bristles came, was what was used before nylon came in. Now when you brush your teeth or you brush your hair, whatever it is, if you have hair, uh, you use a, a brush, which is 99.% going to be nylon. Before nylon came in, bristles was used. Bristles are the hair of an animal. Usually the best ones are from a pig or from a horse. Some other animals were also used. It's still the best. If you go to a high class place and you ask for a good shaving brush or a, a paintbrush that's going to last you, they'll say, you want bristles, you don't want nylon, even to this day. My father was in that business, got into that business. So the Japanese officer says to him, I tell you what, we're going to let you go. We still call, calling you and we think of you as enemy aliens. But we're going to let you go back to your uh, little apartment. But this is what you have to do. From now on, you're going to be responsible for cleaning all the Japanese weapons, especially the rifles. Now, at that time, they also cleaned the rifles with a, 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 a bar of uh, not steel or metal of some sort with the bristles inside at the bottom. And they went up and down. And then they used a little bit of oil and a cloth to get them out. So my father had to make a very quick decision. If he said no, they would have sliced his head off right there and then, and they would have probably killed us. If he said yes, he because he's working with the enemy. So you're damned, you know, between a rock and a hard place. So you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. But uh, he was a quick thinker, and he said yes, absolutely, absolutely. So they let us out. We, start, we went to our apartment, and it wasn't a matter of a couple hours there was a knock on the door, and this man comes in. He was a Filipino, and he said to my father, I want to talk to you. Father goes out, and he says, listen, we already know through the underground what's going on uh, with the Japanese and all. You've got to help us. You can't help the Japanese. And my father says, of course, absolutely, I will help you. And he says, I know what to do already. He said, when I make the cleaning equipment for the rifles and all, I'll put all the bristles in there so it cleans the rifle, but I don't have to put them in too tight, do I? He said, I can put them just in so that after a week, a month, two months, the bristles start clogging the rifle or the machine gun or cannon, whatever they're going to use. And then when it's fired, 
it'll either misfire completely or it'll blow up in your face. So they were happy as can be with my father. They became very, my father became very, very good friends with the Filipinos. And I got to tell you, the Filipino people are the most wonderful people you ever, ever want to meet. Uh, they fought the Japanese through the whole four, four, four and a half years that uh, they had conquered Manila. They conquered Manila, but they didn't win Manila over. And every day you heard about another Japanese, uh, Japanese soldiers killed by guerrillas, by Filipino guerrillas. You know what I'm talking about when I say guerrillas. Uh, it's not guerrillas that you see in the zoo. They used to, now they're called uh, terrorists or they're called underground fighters, whatever, you know, depending which side you're on. Uh, these were basically underground fighters. And uh, at that time, the term guerrillas w were used. And my f father w uh, w did quite a few things with them, which I'll go on as we, uh, we go on. And they left us alone for a while. But it's now 1942, 43, the war is beginning to change. Uh, we heard about the Battle of Midway. That was a very big battle between America and Japan, where America broke the code of the Japanese uh, Navy and Air Force, and they sank a bunch of uh, Japanese aircraft carriers, etc. And the war was beginning to, beginning to change on America's side. Every once in a while, we'd even see an American plane up in the air, you know, a fighter plane. But the... Uh, it, it, it just got to be very bad. And one day we were out on Dewey Boulevard. Dewey Boulevard is on the Pacific Ocean. And from there, you'll see the most beautiful sunsets that you can imagine. And it was just a way of getting our mind off the war and everything that was happening. Uh, it was not pleasant being under the Japanese, to say the least. Uh, they were very, very cruel. And every time you saw a Japanese soldier or something, you had to bow down. And if you didn't bow down long enough, you'd lose the top of your head. It, it was terrible. We were on the boulevard. It was my father, my two brothers, and myself. And we were having a walk. And also my father says, you know, there's something wrong here. Something is going on. He saw the boulevard kind of emptying out. And he heard the rumble of trucks and everything. There's a whole bunch of Japanese trucks come up full of soldiers. And they rounded everybody up on the boulevard. Uh, foreigners, Filipinos, whoever was there. And my father said, oh boy, here I am with three children, you know, the easier to kill us than to try to question or do anything with us. And with that, he spots a garbage truck on the corner and there are a couple of Filipinos there and they're going like this. And my father's trying to get to them and he, one of the Filipinos quickly came to us and he winked at my father and said, give us the children. We're, we, we can't save you, but we can save the children. And they threw us into a garbage truck. They, the Filipinos got back in the truck. No Japanese soldier wanted to get close to a smelly, dirty garbage truck. Uh, and they knew exactly where we lived and everything. These were underground fighters. They were guerrillas for sure. We drop us off at the apartment where we were. We go up the stairs, we knock on the door, my mother opens up and she said, boy, you stink, what were you doing? Where's your father? And we told her, the Japanese took him away. Of course, she broke down, they washed us all up and everything, and we were just sitting there waiting to see if he would be come back to us or if they were gonna kill him or what, we didn't know. They took my father to a high security prison because they figured he knows something or doing something that's against the Japanese. And now it was nightfall. It, full of prisoners everywhere and nobody knew what was going on. They threw my father into a cell uh, and he figured, you know, very little chance of getting away with this. And he, again, he remembered the Japanese were terrible, terrible smokers. Now for the first time ever, a cigarette saved a life. My father had a package of camel cigarettes in his pocket. He was a smoker at that time also, but he saved them only for very difficult times. And when things quieted down a little bit and it was nightfall, he had a Japanese guard by his cell and my father tapped him on the soldier, on the shoulder. He turned around, my father shows him the package of cigarettes. And he said, you know what? Open the gate, open the gate, let me out. I'll give you the cigarettes. And the Jap, he was delighted, you know, he says, the hell with it. he took the cigarettes, he opened my, the gate and he told my father, okay, run, run. 
My father was smart enough not to run because he knew if he ran, some soldiers would see him and immediately shoot him because he's running. Very casually walked out till he got out of the prison yards, and then he ran all the way home, which was quite a way. I, he had somebody picked him up too, I think. I don't remember the exact story. I think it was like 2 o'clock in the morning when he knocks on the door, and he comes in and he told us uh, what happened and how he escaped. Nobody even knew that he was captured or anything. You know, it was uh, such a mess over there. More time goes by and things are getting hotter. You begin seeing American planes over, you see some bombing. And again, one day my father took my two brothers and I out. We were uh, on the boulevard and then we come back home and we're climbing the stairs to our small apartment. And next door to our apartment, it was always empty. Door opens and there's a man standing there and he goes like this to my father, and my father looks at him, and he looks inside. There is a big Nazi flag, swastika. My father was scared stiff. I could see the first time I really saw my father shaking because he figures, well, the Gestapo is here or whatever. They're going to kill us. I said, not the children, just you. My father pushed us into the apartment. He goes into his apartment. He comes out about 20 minutes later, he comes into our apartment, and he says, you know, there are still some good people around, some good Germans. This man is going to be working with the German embassy, and he said to me, he said, look, I'm a German, I'm not a Nazi, I've worked for the government, I've worked for the government all my life. I guess he was a middle-aged man, I barely, barely remember him. He says. I think what's going on in Europe is terrible. I've got nothing against Jews or anybody else. But he said, you better get the hell out of here because it's going to, the Japanese are going to take over the garrison and the apartment buildings and probably it's going to be open for German officers, etc. My father got hold of the Filipino guerrillas again. They came the next morning. Now again, remember, you're not even 24 hours go by and you've got to get the hell out of where you are and not even know where you're going. They come with two big oxen tied to a wagon. They threw what little stuff we had on it and we headed out. We headed out, I believe it was towards Passaic, it was in the Pasig River. Pasig River runs around Manila and they stop at this ha uh, house. It was an, <coughs> excuse me, an old Spanish house Walls are thick, really thick walls, Spanish style, uh, hacienda type of uh, place. And he said, they told us, okay, just stay here, don't worry about anything, stay here. It's got very thick walls because another two, three years, the war is going to be over, the Americans will come, but there's going to be a lot of fighting and these walls can protect you. We went in there, we, little we had. Uh, at this time already, we're becoming very, very ill, dengue fever, this fever, that fever. I came out uh, with some kind of a rash. I blew up like a balloon. Uh, didn't think we did. No doctors around, nothing. It was pure luck that I made it al uh, out alive. Basically, our ration was rice and fish. My father sometimes disappeared for a few days, came back, he always had some food, some kind of rice or something with him. And I'm sure it came from the gorillas. And I believe he also, from what I understand, was helping them with uh, downed American flyers to hide them. Uh, that, that was pretty much the way our life went. No schooling, no nothing. Then, as things got worse and worse and worse, uh, we saw more and more American planes go by, and every once in a while they dropped leaflets and they said, hold on, we're coming back, we're coming back. Sometimes they dropped matchboxes and had a picture of General MacArthur who was in charge of the whole Pacific Theater. And he said, I shall return, I shall return. But bombings came, shellings, and more and more people and friends of ours were getting killed. And my parents thought, you know, what do we do? Do we make five separate shelters so someone will survive? or do we take our chances on one shelter and we all make it or we all don't make it. And 
How can you live with the fact that you put your child in a shelter, separate shelter, he's killed and you're alive? How do you think? Or if when your parents are killed and you're alive, what do you do? They decided that either we all make it or we all don't make it. And he built a shelter right in the house, in this thick-walled house, which already had holes in it from the uh, bombs and everything and shrapnel. He put two old Spanish tables, one on top of another, threw some mattresses on the top and everything. It was hot as the dickens inside there, but you know what, you're alive. And he said, if you hear a siren or if you hear a plane, just dive into there. And it wasn't much bigger than what you see right here. Uh, and many hours were spent in there, many, many, many hours. The uh, war was getting worse. The Japanese were getting crueler. Uh, let, let, let me just go back, because I just remembered something to Belgium. We, we managed to escape. Most people did not manage to escape. One of, one of the friends of my parents had an apartment in Antwerp, and it was a husband, wife, and two tiny children, two little children. The Nazis came in. They came. They shot the man immediately. They killed him right there. They pushed a woman down the stairs. She's holding her two little babies. And they were rounding people up and said, get on the truck, get on the truck. And she managed to climb in the truck and she's holding two babies. This well, so-called well-dressed German officer comes up and says, only one child. You can only take one child. Throw the other one out and give him to us. And she said, these are my two children. Where they go, I go. She said, lady, I can kill you all right here or throw down one of the children. She lost it. I mean, she lost it completely. She ended up taking both children and throwing them out. She was taken to Buchenwald, which was a concentration camp. When we heard the story, we were sure that she was died also. It wasn't until, I think, in the early 1960s, my parents found out she lived through the concentration camp, but she went pretty much insane, which is very understandable. But she got to New York. Uh, she, of course, naturally was never the same, but my parents got hold of her and they were friends for a while. And for the life of me, I don't remember her name. I remember, I know the story, but I can't remember this poor woman's name. So anyway, now getting back to Manila, it's just to tell you what happened with the Germans, with all the people that they killed. It was ended up over a million children. What was their crime? They were born with a, because they were Jewish or Catholic or something like that. This is what it was. Now we're in Manila again. The war is coming to a very heated ending, bombing all over, Japanese killing people left, right, and center. There was a Catholic school not too far from where we were, and they got all the nuns, and they raped the nuns, and they used the priests for target practice. This was what was going on. My brother and I, my middle brother and I, were out one day, and my father took a pair of roller skates and put a piece of wood on top of them. So we used it somewhat like a roller board or a, a scooter type of thing. And we were going up and down the street. This is before we moved. And one house had a German flag out there. We paid no attention to it. I didn't know what it was at the time. I think I must have been seven or eight years old. Uh, and there was a Japanese officer right around where we were, there was a billet of Japanese soldiers. And we became friendly, believe it or not, my brother and I, with one of the officers there. And he liked us to a point where we, he used to see us and wave to us, and he used to call us over, and we used to sit with him, and he showed us pictures of his family in Japan. It was something, you know, but we were kids. We figured, well, everybody's like that. Anyhow, we go on this rollerboard, and we're going down the street, and we're just about at the house where that flag was. And a man comes out screaming at us, you filthy little Jew bastards. What do you think you're doing on my street and on siesta time? And how dare you be here? He said, you're going to get yours soon enough. And with that, he slapped us. We fell on the ground. My brother and I were just bleeding a little bit because we were scraped on the ground. He took the skateboard and he says, you're going to get yours very soon. We're going to get all of you. We're going to finish all you Jews. And he went back into the house. My brother and I was sitting there, we didn't crying, bleeding a little bit. And I said to my brother, why is he calling us filthy Jews? He said, we, we had a bath this morning. I had no idea what he was talking about. Yeah. And we start to walk home, we're crying. 
And who's on the corner? A Japanese friend, Muna, the, the, the officer. And he looks at us and he waves us to come over and we're standing there. To, and he says, what, what's the matter? What happened? And we managed to communicate with him, tell him what happened. With that, he blows a whistle. Out of one of the apartments comes about 12, 13 Japanese soldiers, fixed bayonets with their rifles. They didn't know. All they know was an alarm, and they had to be there. And six of them surround my brother and I. In a, we were in the middle of a circle, and then the other Japanese soldiers were around them. And my mother's looking out the window, and she sees all these Japanese soldiers and us in the middle. And she, I could see she was already crying. She figures, well, they're taking, taking us away to kill us. But I waved to my mother. I don't know if she saw us bleeding or not. Uh, and she was somewhat relieved. But, you know, still, we're under Japanese soldiers. And he said, to show me the house. Show me the house. We get to the house. And he's talking Japanese to the soldiers to get the door open. And it's banging on the door. The German opens the door. And he sees us. And he sees the Japanese soldiers. There was no great love between the Japanese and the Germans. The Germans looked down on them, and the Japanese uh, hated the, the Germans also, because first of all, they were white, and the Japanese were yellow, and it was uh, a whole big to do. You know, you can't win in this world. And the German sees us. <coughs> he knows he's in trouble. And the Japanese soldier points at the skateboard. So he says, oh, yes, yes, yes. He picks up the skateboard. And he goes to my brother and he goes, nice boy, nice boys, nice boys. With that, my brother, <laughs> gutsy little boy, he must have been eight years old, nine years old, goes like this, whack, and he smacks the German right in the face. Glasses go flying off. Yeah, I think he could have killed my brother right there and then and me afterwards. The Japanese soldiers thought it was the funniest thing they ever, they ever saw. And they're laughing and laughing. What could he do? picks up the skateboard and he gives it to us and the Japanese officer Muna goes like this to him. He warns him and says, yes, yes, nice boys, nice boys, picked up his glass, put him on and he goes to me. He says, okay, nice boy, nice boy. My brother sees it again, he gives him another whack <laughs> and the glasses and he's like this, you know, he doesn't know what to do. His wife is standing next to him. I mean, I think if ever he wanted to kill anybody, it was right there and then again, what was he going to do to us? And the Japanese soldiers were just cracking up. They were cracking up. They thought it was so, so funny. So he closes the door and we go out. And Muna says to us, where you go? Where you go? He said, I'm going home to see my mama. He said, no, 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 no. You not go home. He said, you stay right here. I want you every day, starting now. You go up and down the street in front of his house on your rolls. Can make I want you to make a lot of noise. <laughs> And that was that incident. So even among the enemy, you see, there are good people. Don't think he was a nice guy, but he was good to us because we saw some things that he did that you wouldn't believe. Uh, there was one poor Filipino who stole something, and I was standing right there, and I saw the whole thing where they captured him. They tied him to a telephone pole, and they put his head up so that he be facing the sun all the time. They put some kind of sticks by his eyes, so his eyes are open. He was blind, of course, in one day. And anybody who walked by, they put a sign up, who didn't hit him or put a stick into him or something would get the same treatment. And I think it was four or five days he was dead. It was terrible torture, terrible. Uh, but for the Japanese, it was what it was. Uh, that was that. Now getting back to the house in Manila, uh, it was fairly quiet for a while, but again the war was getting worse and worse, and the bombings became terrible, really, really terrible, it was shaking and shaking. Uh, and after one of the bombardments, my brother said to me, my oldest brother, let's go outside for a little bit. And we did, and went out looking around, and we saw that there were Japanese soldiers quite just about everywhere. So I went right back inside. And a few days later, I was sitting with my mother. By the, there was an open kitchen there. And I was sitting there talking to her. And she had an iron. Now, there was no electricity, remember, and it's hot as hell. She was trying to iron something. I don't remember what it was and why she would do it. It was one of those irons where you put hot charcoals in to heat everything up. 
and we're talking. And we hear the gate opening. I said, oh, Papa is here. My, my father, uh, father is here. And it wasn't my father. It was a Japanese soldier, very disheveled. And he had his rifle and his bayonet. And he looked at my mother and he looked at me. Now, my mother knew exactly what was up. And she said to me in French, whatever happens, don't move. Don't move. I didn't know what rape was, but I knew this fellow was up to no good. And he stared at me and, you know, went like this with his rifle and pushed, go inside. And my mother kept saying in French, don't move, don't move. And he approached me, he got closer, again with his rifle. I was, I wasn't scared, I was just full of hate. No one's going to touch my mama, my mother, was I'm here, I can do something. And I'm only a tiny kid. I mean, he could have stepped on me. And then he started to approach my mother. And my mother takes the iron like this. And you could see the heat, the charcoals. And he looked. And then he looked at me again. And he tried to push me out. And I just sat there staring at him. And my mother stared at him also, full of fate. And I guess he knew, you know, no matter what, he was going to get hurt pretty badly with that iron. So he turned around and he left. And with that, we both, both broke down. My father came home back about an hour later or so. We told him what happened. What, what can you do? What can you do? Weeks went by. We were all getting sicker and sicker and more tired and hungrier and hungrier. My father got hold of a chicken. I don't know, probably from one of the Filipino gorillas or something. At least we'll have eggs. Took weeks. Finally, this chicken laid one egg and dropped dead. <laughs> that was it. One egg in four and a half years, we waited. My mother boiled the egg, it was hard boiled, sliced five slices, and we each had a little piece of an egg. <laughs> that was it. So as it got uh, pretty bad, we used to see the American uh, planes fly by and bombing and strafing and dog fights between Japanese planes and American planes. And we saw an American plane being shot down. I don't know if it was anti-aircraft or a Japanese plane that hit it. And we see the parachute. And my oldest brother said, come on, maybe we can do something to help this pilot. And we tried to follow where he was going to land. It wasn't that far from where we were. We already saw some Filipinos over there looking. And he landed. And I said to my brother, come on, let's save him. He's just lying there. You know, maybe he's hurt a little bit. Young boy, maybe I see his face still. 19, 20, how old could he have been? He's lying there. He was dead. He was dead. Nothing could save him. And with that, we hear the Filipinos saying in Tagalog, which is their language, better run because the Japanese soldiers are coming here. And I kept telling my brother, no, he's not dead. Let's pick him up, pick him up, let's get him. But I saw that some of the Filipinos tried to turn him over and get his weapon. They all had 45s. And there was a hole in his back. I mean, he, he was shot to pieces. But I think even now, you know, I see his face. If only I could have known his name, know something that when we were liberated, if we were going to be liberated, and if we could get to America, and if I could see his parents and tell him, you know, I knew your son for one minute. I saw him. He didn't suffer. He saved all our lives because of people like him. I didn't. I just have his face in my mind. No way. I don't know. So we went home and that was it. Then there was another more and more bombings and things got worse and worse. And we were running out of food. We were pretty emaciated and we were getting sicker. And again, after a bombing, my, my two brothers and I went out and there was a church not too far from our house and had a big steeple. Uh, half of it was bombed out. But like stupid kids, we decided to go in and see what we could see of uh, Manila Bay, of the Pasig River rather and the other side. So we climbed up fairly high and we looked out and guys, you know what we saw? Angels. The American army was across the river. Thousands of American soldiers, the flag, pontoon boats for them to cross, tanks, you name it, it was there, but thousands of flags everywhere. And we just couldn't believe our eyes. We were going to be saved, we were going to live after all. 
I mean, in my own mind, even as a child, I said, I'm going to get killed one of these days, you know, so whatever happens, happens. You don't think because you don't know anything else. And then we, we ran home and we told our parents, we were yelling, Papa, Mama, you see, Vinay, see, Vinay, see, come here. And they opened, what's the matter? He said, the Yanks are here, the Yanks are here, the Americans are here. I said, no, it can't be. It can't be. It's going to be another few weeks, maybe months before they come. He said, no, we saw the flag. And as we were talking, we heard rumbling down the road. And my, my father said, we better go inside. It's probably Japanese soldiers in retreat or something. We said, no, it's the Americans, it's the Americans, the Americans. And sure enough, around the corner, we saw the flag. We saw a tank. We saw jeeps. We saw and this one soldier comes to me, and, and he sees how emaciated and everything we are. He puts his arm on me, and he says, how would you like Baby Ruth? Do you know what Baby Ruth is? And I looked at him, and I looked at my mother, and I said, Mama, I le bet. This man is crazy. Look at us. He wants to give me his Baby Ruth. <laughs> you know, and they all started laughing, and they explained to me, and so every time now I see a baby Ruth, you know, I have a warm, warm feeling for these Americans. This is, we became well, quite friendly with him, <clears throat> and he wrote a letter, because there was no mail or anything at that time, but he got through because he was a uh, lieutenant colonel through the Red Cross. He wrote a letter to my uh, uncle, my mother's brother, who was in America at the time, just to tell him that we were alive and everything and uh, that we, we, we managed to survive the Japanese. Now, I lost, we lost contact with him. I didn't know anything about him. And funny enough, I get a call about, a, not even a month ago, a few weeks ago, from the librarian uh, at the Parkland Library, said there was a woman here, the name was Mrs. Duffy, and her son, Jackson, 10 years old, has a tremendous interest in the Holocaust. And we thought maybe there would be something at the library, but you know, we, you've already spoken here a few times. Would you like to speak to them? I told them I, would, uh, I could give you the number. So I said, absolutely. If a 10-year-old child is interested in the Holocaust, uh, to me, in my mind, he's a reincarnation. You know, something there. Because what 10-year-old child wants to go to the library and read about the Holocaust? So I called her up. She lives uh, up uh, here in Heron Bay, and named Jody Duffy. And I called her, and she called me back. And we had a lovely conversation. And she came here with her husband, Jim, and, and Jackson, her son. And then we spent time like I'm spending with you. And then I get an invitation to the children's school. He goes to Calvin Christian Academy, which is in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> and I just spoke there yesterday. 225 children, beautiful campus, I mean, a gorgeous place, uh, and told, told them the story. But we became very friendly, and her husband does a lot of volunteer work with all the armed forces, especially veterans, etc., of World War II. And I told, her about, I told him about this Colonel Hall, and that I don't know how to get hold of him. I thought he was killed, but apparently he was only wounded. And uh, Jim, her husband, got hold of people in the Pentagon, and he died in 1990, 1991, and he sent me the, a copy of the grave. Uh, he said he's buried in Texas, and it says World War II and the Korea. So that's the only thing I have, but I, they're trying to find out if there's any living relatives, children, grandchildren. I would like to tell them how this one colonel saved our lives. We had food on the table. The Americans billeted right next to us. Uh, they, my, my wife puts out bird food all the time. That's what, what, you're, what, you're, what you're hearing. Uh, they hide in there and then they come out. We, uh, my brother and I used to go to where the Americans were uh, billeted to station, which was not far, maybe from here to the, end, to the end of the road here. And they gave us spam. We thought it was a filet mignon because we hadn't eaten in so long, and these soldiers hated it. You know, they were cursing it out every time, and we were loving it. Now, they set up a hospital unit there. There was the ground, there was a big mound, 
where uh, we sat, and after that was a field and the jungle, and jungle in the Philippines is very, very thick. So we're sitting there, my brother and I, with the soldiers one afternoon, some Filipino guerrillas were there also, and we were eating, and all of a sudden, ta -ta 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 the machine gun fire coming at us from all over. And the next thing I knew, I feel an arm around me, I see that my brother in the corner of my eye being held by another soldier and rolling down the hill. It was Japanese snipers in the jungle. They had these heavy machine guns. They were just trying to kill as many Americans and whoever else was there as possible. And we were pinned down. We couldn't do anything. I was so angry, not at the fact that I'm being shot at. I didn't have my food. I mean, we was just so, you know, so hungry all the time. Like we're lying there and Filipino guerrillas crawled out to where we were and some of the other soldiers. Uh, they didn't have weapons. Everything was built inside. We thought we were a relatively safe place. And they said, listen, give us a half hour. Don't shoot because I don't, don't, they don't want to get caught in the crossfire. Don't shoot. If in half an hour you don't hear from us or you don't see us, then you can call in the artillery to try to shell that area where the uh, machine gun probably is. So we waited, we waited. I don't know how long it was. Next thing, you no, know, I hear some screaming. That was it. It's quiet again. And all of a sudden, two Filipinos guerrillas are walking across the field with their machetes, and they're holding something in their hand. They snuck up behind the Japanese with their machetes, and they cut their heads off. And to, you know, it, don't think it's cruel. This is war. This is what it is. What it is. They were getting their revenge for the, all the terrible times that they, they had. And one of the Japanese soldiers still had his glasses on. And they were just throwing their head around. Now, Santa Tomas, who I told you we were taken to uh, at the beginning of the war, was used as a prison camp all the time. My father was taken there a few times and managed again to get released. But at the end of the war, Japanese soldiers told the uh, signal to the Americans that if you try to come in here, we're going to kill everyone there. And there was a couple, few hundred, maybe a thousand prisoners there, uh, mostly Americans. So they got some negotiations going. Finally, they said, okay, you let us in. You and your uh, soldiers can go out without your weapons, without your weapons, and you can go find your Japanese troops or whatever you want. But you, you, no one's going to hurt you in this place. So they made the deal. They gave up their weapons to the American soldiers, and they started marching out. No, everyone said, you know, we won't bother you as long as you're in the prison camp. But nobody said, what can happen when you get out? Right around the corner, there were some Jap uh, Japanese, some uh, Filipino guerrillas waiting for them. And they got theirs. They got theirs for all the torture, for all the horrible things that they did for four years. Uh, that was pretty much it. All of a sudden, it's uh, now March 1945. Uh, things are settling down a bit. We got more food in our stomach. We were seen to by doctors. It's the Jewish holiday of Passover, <coughs> which usually comes out about the same time as Easter. And bless these Yanks, they knew what we all went through. They got, they rounded up jeeps, they rounded up where every Jewish family was that they knew about, possibly knew about, and they, we, they came for us, we were all put into jeeps, they took us to a stadium where there was horse racing. We had the first Passover dinner there, the whole Jewish, and you gotta know, I mean, this was dark, there were snipers all over the place, and potholes from the shelling and everything, but somehow or other, these soldiers, and I don't know how they even found their way to the uh, uh, horse racing stadium, and there were two rabbis there and some priests who held the services together, and we had matzah, which is the unleavened bread, uh, first time. And the fellow, there's four questions that are asked during the holidays, and this is the boy who was one of our neighbors, uh, asked the four questions. And he made it to America also, by the way, became an engineer. And unfortunately, he wrote this book uh, dedicated to us, uh, to Margaret and Eric. And uh, it's uh, quite a few pictures in here, by the way, if you want to look through. 
and uh, the soldiers brought us back. How we weren't shot at, how nothing happened. Because even after that, there's always shooting, always snipers and this and that. But again, the Filipino guerrillas knew where the Japanese were going to hide. There was one school there called La Salle. It was a, a Catholic school where a lot of us went to because it wouldn't let the Japanese close all the schools down. When the soldiers got there, the nuns, they found the nuns all raped and shot, and the priests were hung and used for target practice. There was one hotel that the Japanese left open during the war. They rounded up as many women as they could, uh, basically Filipino women. Also, they were raped constantly within a two-day, three-day period and uh, shot also. The war is slowly, slowly coming to an end now. Because of my uncle again, we manage, and my father, and I'll show you some pictures inside uh, from General MacArthur's headquarters, because of all he did during the war, how he helped, uh, not only with the brushes and everything, but uh, I believe he hit some pilots. He helped the guerrillas a lot because he disappeared quite a few times. And you got to understand, you got to be a pretty gutsy guy. You got a family of five that you're in charge of and yet you've managed to disappear and reappear and disappear and reappear and you got responsibilities and yet he helped so many. <clears throat> when the bombing right at the end got so bad it was impossible, refugees were streaming out of everywhere and my father took them and my mother took them all into our home. I don't remember how many there were but you could see some of them were too old to walk and there was like a, a push cart that they were putting them in and all. And they stayed with us forever, ever, as long as need be, till we were freed, until we were able to get out. And that, that's it. I, I'll continue now. We, we came to America. Uh, there were a lot of prisoners from Bataan and Corregidor. There was, I think, nearly 100,000 American soldiers that were captured at that time. And we were, uh, some of them were liberated with us. And uh, we were on board. We landed in San Francisco, from San Francisco to New York. And we stayed with family there. Uh, the adjustment was very, very difficult. I mean, I grew up no childhood. My grandparents were killed, and my, my father was originally from Lithuania, I think I told you. His parents stayed there. Uh, he said, my, my grandfather said he's too old to travel, and they didn't think they would be hurt. My grandfather was taken to Auschwitz. My grandmother was killed right there in the house. I never knew my grandparents. I never was held by a grandparent. I never had a childhood, nor did my brothers. We didn't know what a childhood was. But when you grow up in this, you think that, well, this is childhood. This is how you grow up. We didn't know anything. There's nothing to compare to. And my mother wrote a letter uh, in 1945. If you want to try and read it, I very difficult for me. And we went to, uh, I see stores, I saw a few American soldiers, I mean, it's full of American soldiers still in the States. I couldn't adjust. I had a very, very difficult time adjusting. Come September, to go to school, I'm 10 years old now, I never stepped foot in the school, I didn't even know what a school was. So. I am sent there and I look and I know, I grew up, my father always saying, know how to escape, know how to run, know how to hide. And this teacher had her arm around me, her name was Charlotte Ettinger, I remember her to this day, was the most lovely woman. She walked me up to the class with some other kids, go into the room and they shut the door. She says, I can't be in here. I mean, there could be a bombing, there could be snipers, there could be anything. I ran out of there like a bat out of hell. Of course, they caught me and everything, and they tried to explain to me. I couldn't. I couldn't. Anywhere, everywhere I went, you know, I always knew how to get out, how to escape. And it start, somebody started shooting where to hide, how to hide. And I got to tell you guys, even to this day, this is something that stays with me. Wherever I go, by habit, I always look, where's the exit? Where do you get out in the back? Where can you hide? It's part of life. I 
my oldest brother is still alive. He's four years older than me. He's a psychologist. He went to uh, Brown University and he went to Yale and University of Pennsylvania. He's got a few doctorates. Uh, he goes through the hell also sometimes because I talk to him often. Uh, my other brother passed away. He, uh, he was very, very sick. Uh, my mother passed away very young also. She was 46. She got cancer at 43. She passed away at 46. She didn't survive the war, basically. She was always a sick woman. But then I went to, uh, managed to get through high school just about. I went to a small college in uh, a Methodist school in, in West Virginia, Wesleyan College. And I got involved in Wall Street. I was working there. Got an apartment with a friend of mine that I had met. And in uh, 1964, my wife, who's from England, was here on a trip. We met, and uh, nine months later, we were married. It's 45 years now, three children. Unfortunately, my middle son, at the age of 30, uh, was out in California. He was working there. He was a brilliant mathematician. He was six foot three, strong as an ox, loved sports, moved out to California because he wanted to be outdoors all the time. And we get a call one day, state police in California, um, Mrs. Lippitz, she said, yes, said, your son Ari, yes. He was playing basketball and he had a seizure. He was sent to a hospital, Scripps in uh, San Diego, and you better get over here because he's a very sick boy. They found a tumor in his brain. My middle son, my strongest kid, I'll show you a picture of him. How can this be? Of course, my oldest son and I, uh, we, and my daughter, we all managed to meet up and we went to California. And they told us he's got a tumor on his brain the size of a grapefruit. I couldn't believe it. He looked so good, he looked so healthy. He was lying in, in the hospital bed, two of his girlfriends on each side, talking away. It's impossible. But we decided, we called up a friend of ours who was a uh, neurologist in Philadelphia, and he says, get him to New York and get him to NYU or, or one of the big hospitals there. <clears throat> he made an appointment for us. We got back to New York, and we uh, met uh, head of surgery, neurosurgery at NYU, uh, Patrick Kelly, wonderful uh, surgeon. And he, he took pictures, and sure enough, he had a huge, huge tumor couldn't believe how big it was and that he was functioning. They took it out and they uh, did biopsies on it. They couldn't figure out exactly what it was. In my gut, I knew what it was. It was brain cancer. It's the worst thing that you can imagine because it eats away at you slowly. He managed to, most people don't live for a year. He managed three years and I took him all over. We went to Israel where they were working with scorpions the poison of scorpions to kill cancer uh, tumors, but it was too early stages to do anything. Came back here, and he slowly, slowly started to, you lose the feelings in your leg, couldn't move his arm, he went blind, and he died. He went, ended up in St. Vincent's and, uh, in New York, and he passed away there. People say to me, what was the worst thing that happened to you in your life? figuring with the war. And I said, no, with the war, I didn't know any different. But when you're a parent and you lose a child, it's nothing worse. That was it. After that, my daughter uh, met her boyfriend in uh, Wagner College. Uh, he was a Florida boy, and he got a job with AT&T, and they moved down here in Margate. Uh, and I, couldn't, I couldn't work anymore after my son died. I just... Uh, we sold the house. We were lucky, it was the height of the market at that time. And we came down here also. We lived in Margate for a while and then we came here. And I'm thinking, what do I do with myself? And my oldest brother called me one day and said, you know, I made a documentary called Rescue in the Philippines uh, with some people. And they're in, the, in Florida now and they're giving talks everywhere. Would you like to talk? And I often, I never talked about what happened with anybody. It was kind of, I don't know, an embarrassment or I felt guilty because how did I survive? Millions of people were killed. What am I, just a guy who was working and got married with three children, asthma, so what? You know, what did I do? But I, I said yes. 
And I started talking, I think now it must be five, six years ago. This was in uh, uh, Miami, I believe, I gave a talk. And I said, this is what I meant to do, to talk to kids about hate, about prejudice, about bullying, about what can happen in life and how to be good people. Uh, respect for the flag, respect for your country. I always tell them, hug your parents. If you got grandparents, hear their stories no matter what. No, and, and this is what, uh, what I do now. Anywhere I can, anybody that wants a speaker, whether it's one person or a whole school full, uh, is what I do. And here we are, guys, peanuts and water. Okay, is that enough? Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope I didn't bore you. <laughs>